The Monaghan Lunatic Asylum opened in 1869 to cater to people with mental health needs from counties Monaghan and Cavan. The name was changed to the Monaghan Mental Hospital in 1924 and it was again renamed St Davenant's in the 1950s. The institution's long history and the records that survive show how mental illness was perceived and treated in Ireland over the years. The Inspector of Lunatics was the title of the official who supervised the Monaghan Asylum and others like it. In this excerpt from an 1896 report, the inspector addresses the conduct and the clothing of the patients. The behaviour of the patients, with few exceptions, was quiet and orderly. The clothing of both sexes is much improved. The men now wear tweed and their clothing is sufficiently warm. But I think neckties should be given in all cases. The women's gowns are better made and some variety in colour has been introduced. The men's shirts are changed once a week and in the case of men employed at outside work, twice in the week. Most of the men's outer clothing is obtained by contract. Only a few suits are made in the tailor's shop where all repairs are done. An excerpt from an 1896 report on the Monaghan Lunatic Asylum. To talk about the history of this institution, I'm joined in studio by three guests, consultant, psychiatrist and historian Professor Brendan Kelly, medical historian Dr Anne McLennan and Fiona Kelly, manager of the World Within Walls project, which aims to remember and record the history of this former psychiatric hospital. Brendan, tell us first of all about the asylum system uh, in late 1860s, early 1870s and where Monaghan fitted into it. The asylums in Ireland really started in the early 1800s and there were um, waves of asylum building and Monaghan was it really in the third wave of these when it opened toward the end of the 1800s. Um, it was part of a bigger system that was truly astonishing. At the start of the 1800s there were fewer than 2,000 people in um, psychiatric hospitals of any sort. By the end there was around 12,000. Um, in 1960 it had reached 20,000 and now we're back again at around 2,000. So we've come, we're back where we started in terms of inpatient numbers. And how did Ireland then compare in terms of inpatient numbers with, uh, with you know, with the rest of other countries in Europe? Well, at our peak um, in the 1950s, we probably had the highest number of persons in um, psychiatric hospitals, certainly in Europe or the United States and possibly in the world. Now, though, there's been a huge change and our admission rates are well below the EU average and our detention rates are well below those in, for example, England. What's intriguing is why the asylums grew so large um, and, and what were the alternatives that, that could have been put in place. Um, the system changed over the years. In the 1900s, there were many admissions and discharges, so there was a a churning of people in and out of the asylums and they were very much being used for a range of different purposes rather than being static or monolithic in the way they're often seen. So it wasn't that we suffered a, a greater incidence of mental illness than the French, the Germans, the, the British or the Americans? No. No, there's, there's no evidence to support that. Now, it is admittedly difficult to figure that out because psychiatrists, my profession, we keep changing the definition of what is or is not a mental illness. So it's virtually impossible to figure out um, epidemiologically. But certainly there are so many other good explanations for the asylums, things to do with the social circumstances, um, poverty, um, a lack of um, support for people with intellectual disability at home. Um, there's a whole range of other reasons that are, in my view, more compelling to explain why the asylums grew so large. Okay, in relation to Monaghan specifically, Anne, what do we know about the first patients? Well, the first patients that came to Monaghan largely came from Armagh Asylum. Armagh had been founded in 1825. It was the first district asylum in Ireland and it was a when it was founded, it catered for patients from Fermanagh, Monaghan, Cavan 
and um, Armagh itself. So it became very overcrowded. And the year before Monaghan Asylum was actually founded, um, we hear of the people running Armagh Asylum asking, can they rent rooms in the town jail to put people into? Can they put people into the basement? The resident medical superintendent offers to move out and people can move in there. So the first patients that come back to, to Monaghan are people who would have come from Cavan and Monaghan counties but had been in Armagh for some time in a horribly overcrowded environment. So it must have been a big relief both to them to move out of it and to the people who were left there that there were now going to be in all 113 spaces where, where vacancies were made when those patients came into Monaghan. And why were they admitted? There was, a, I think, there's a, uh, the register is available, and there's a column supposed cause of insanity. Well, what, generally speaking, was filled in there? Well, there's a variety of different causes. So for two men, we see intemperance being written down as the cause of, supposed cause of their illness. Then we have a 28-year-old female servant who has seduction listed as the cause of her insanity, and that seems very sad. However, she was only in Monaghan for two years, and then she was discharged, recovered, in September 1871. Um, there were two more women who were both suffering from mania, and they were supposed to have been in there because of poverty and overwork. And you see poverty and reverse of fortune as um, at the root of a lot of people's illness and there was, seemed to be a recognition that this could cause um, mental trauma or perhaps a recognition that there was nowhere else to put them at the time. Um, later on we see um, a number of different men coming in and there are things like jealousy listed and... <laughs> Jealousy. Yeah, okay. interesting. We're interesting. not quite sure how to, yeah. to, to interpret that. <laughs> and I suppose the sad thing that you see is a lot of the people's journeys are from one institution to another. So we have one woman who was an inmate in what they called the idiot ward of the workhouse and she became violent. Then she was sent to the jail and then after that she was admitted into Monaghan. So she spent her life basically shuttling between these pretty nasty institutions. Mm. Now, monotony and boredom were the major enemies of institutionalised patients and work was thought of as a form of therapy. In this excerpt from uh, an inspector's report from 1911, the inspector writes about the patient's work at the Monaghan Lunatic Asylum. It was satisfactory to note the large number of patients daily employed at various kinds of work. Excluding those assisting in the wards, 245 men and 229 women were usefully engaged on the first day of our visit. Of those, 207 men work on the farm. Knitting and needlework give occupation to 181 women. 34 work in the laundry and 12 in the kitchen. Right, um, that was an excerpt from a 1911 report. It sounds as if they were kept pretty busy, Anne. Yeah, I suppose that the, the, the point that, that has been made by that as well is that Monaghan Asylum was effectively two worlds within one complex. So male and female patients were segregated where they lived and what they worked at. So the men were able to work um, as garden or field labourers. They might assist the attendants in the wards. They also worked with the tradesmen. For women, it was much more limited and their work was much more difficult. So they might be in the laundry, which is a very heavy job, with um, a lot of soiled bedclothes from incontinent patients, as well as the everyday clothes of all the patients to be looked after. And the inspectors keep harping on on how this type of work acts as therapy. But if you think about it, these women were standing at rows of Belfast sinks. The inspectors wanted them to use less machinery and basically more woman power and um, at least for the men they got outside and later on in the early 1900s they actually go out to work with farmers at haymaking and flax pulling and so on and they get to work with animals so there, there must have been some element of you know the outdoors and therapy and a change of scene for them whereas for the women it was much more difficult. Tell us about the strike that took place in 1919 because it, things weren't great for the staff either and uh, Pather O'Donnell becomes involved in that but it was, it was more of a lock-in than a lock-out, wasn't it?
That's right. Um, initially in 1918 there was a one week strike and that wasn't successful and the attendants and the nurses and the tradespeople were looking for fewer hours and more money. And then Padre O'Donnell becomes involved and he essentially locks down the asylum and himself and 80 staff go in and he takes over as he calls himself governor of the asylum and they essentially imprison one of the assistant medical officers and the matron to help them to deal with the patients. And um, at the end he does manage to achieve a number of the things that they asked for. So they get um, shorter weeks. They all get a war bonus because this was the end of World War One, and prices had gone up and they were looking for an extra pound a week for everyone. And what was unusual was that women and men both got the same award. And even though their wages remained quite disparate, um, with the men always earning more than the women, in this case they actually did get the same thing at the end of it. Fiona, a big part of your project, World Within Walls, involves collecting oral histories and uh, the, the personal stories that are often absent from uh, medical records. So tell us about the, the kind of stories they're told. Any, are there any stories relating to the strike, for example, or is that uh, f you know, too far uh, in the past? Any, any memories of that? Yeah, so that's that's a little bit too far back. So the furthest back we've actually been able to look is um, the 1930s, 1940s. So um, we've done about 24 interviews in all with staff, ex-staff and families who lived on the site. Um, and, you know, as Anne sort of alluded to there, the site was a huge employer for Calvin and Monaghan and for many of the staff, they lived on site and for certain families, their children would have lived on site as well. So it's those people's childhood memories really that get us back to the 1930s. Um, and... What are, they, what are those memories? I mean, I described it a little bit earlier in the programme as grim. Mm. And, you know, I come from not that far away and certainly that was the reputation it had. Yeah, and I mean, in many cases it would have been. Um, for these individuals, I mean, it, it's quite interesting because they grew up there as children and, say, the daughter of the resident medical superintendent would have had... Um, quite a different life to to the patients and to the to staff who were working there and she's sort of very fond memories of things like the gardens and the patients who worked in her house learning to ride a pony that kind of thing and um, so I mean there was a lot of different lives happening there at the one time as well as as you say the sort of more grim uh, aspect of it. And uh, do you think that you have plumbed the depths of this or are there more people that you can talk to? I mean, there's there's a huge amount of people that could be talked to. Um, we've, as I say, 24 interviews that are really scratching the surface and there's quite a lot of people who want to um, talk and the, the ex-staff are very invested in in the um, asylum, as I say, they live there. So, I mean, there's there's a huge amount of stories being collected but a huge... A lot more to be collected, I would say. Brendan, finally, the last admissions to St Davenant's were in 2011. How different would Davenant's have been in 2011 to 1869? Well, the system had changed very considerably then with the genuine move to community care. Um, th this area was one, was one of the leaders, along with the Clondalkin Service in Dublin, in, in community care. And the challenges we face in mental health services now are very, very different. We don't face the question about the size of institutions. The question we now face is about adequacy of community care. And that's one of the, one of the areas that we continue to work on. We'll have to leave it. And uh, somebody texts Siobhan says, I know many patients in psychiatric hospitals between 1930 and 60 were previous inmates or victims of our industrial schools and orphanages. World Within Walls uh, maps the history of St. Davenant's. It'll be launched on the 23rd of April at uh, the Inthus Theatre in Castle Blaney. For full details, go to our website. This evening's reader was Rachel Breslin. That's it from uh, the programme. Next Sunday, we'll be giving voice to some women of the Easter Rising through song. Then the following day, we'll be bringing you a special programme.